Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I want to thank you for making our time on a very hot day like this um, to come here. And it's not just only hot. I don't know what route you took to Carlton. The traffic is awful. And so it's been quite a challenge in various ways. But I think um, it's one way of the summer announcing that it's fully in our midst right now. Um, so thank you for coming out. And it's that uh, this talk is taking place at a time when Carlton um, students have um, virtually um, ended the school year, and another one is about starting the spring term. And then we also have a lot of students, uh, high school students on campus, and all of that. I know some of you had some challenge getting here, but the important thing is that you're here, and it's a demonstration of uh, your desire to listen to what promises to be a very exciting talk. And I have the honor of formally inviting um, Mr. Sam, architect Sam, to, uh, to this event and to the podium. Now, I would like to locate this introduction properly. Um, in Nigeria, Sam's country of origin, uh, we're very careful about titles. Um, and so it's not unusual to find some Nigerians with prefixes, double prefixes to their names. And then in some cases, you might even have um, you know, suffixes afterwards. And there are situations uh, because we'll be doing at, at, at Summer Institute at the at Carlton, at the FBA Summer Institute, where we're focusing on doing field work in Africa. And I was talking with Sam as a preamble to this talk and something came up about the importance of titles. And so in Nigeria, it's not unlikely to find a very distinguished architect like Sam, who you would invite uh, to give a talk. And if you call him Sam just like that, or put Mr. he might not respond. Uh, because we that's do like- case with me. <laughs> that's, not, that's, not the case. that's not the case with him, unfortunately. Uh, because there's also a cultural context to it where uh, achievement um, is given some kind of recognition uh, in the introduction. Um, in Canada, we do our own culture in a different way uh, that takes away without necessarily stripping the honor um, some of those titles so that we would know that we are all um, equals in a very fundamental sense. So it's my honor. My name is Nduka Utiono, and I'm a professor in the Institute of African Studies. We are excited to I'll be co-hosting this talk, and that we're glad that it's coming at the time that it's coming. Uh, a very important election has taken place in Nigeria, uh, and there has been a shift very similar to and different from what has happened uh, from Sam's um, home state, uh, Malbata, <laughs> where <laughs> province, uh, where uh, there has been a seismic shift in the political equation um, only a few hours ago. Uh, preceding his arrival in order for this talk. So I will very quickly, uh, for some of you in the house who are not very familiar uh, with him, give a, um, a proper introduction. So having successfully designed and managed projects and initiatives in both the private and public sectors in Canada and abroad, Samuel, Sam for short, Ogali, Obo, works to inspire passion of responsible architecture in the built environment. He is motivated by enduring commitment to excellence, innovation, and stewardship. And so you can see that this is a very clear banner in the topic for his talk, uh, stewardship. Sam holds a Bachelor of Science degree in architecture from the Bendels, and then currently Edo State University, now Ambrose Ali University, and a Master of Science degree in architecture from Amadou Bello University in Zaria, Nigeria. He graduated from the University of Alberta, which is also my alma mater, uh, with a Master of Arts, where he was a recipient of the Herbert Marshall McLuhan Graduate Student Award. He was also an honorable nominee for the Student Award for Excellence in Graduate Studies by the Dean of the Faculty of Extension, University of Alberta. Sam is a licensed architect in both Alberta and Texas. Throughout his career and 22 years of various professional experiences, he has pursued excellence and quality in design while 
providing diligent service to clients. As a design architect, Sam has worked on significant projects with various firms, including um, Zero Two Architecture, Cassian, IBI, and F FMA, and some of the very distinguished uh, firms of architects uh, in Southern Africa, in North America. And then um, he, his leadership is demonstrated through projects such as the International Law Enforcement Academy in Gaborón, Botswana, uh, for the U.S. Botswana government. City of Deer, or Red Deer Civic Yards, Villa Charitas, and then so many other very distinguished uh, designs that he has uh, his imprimatur on. Um, he recently led the reorganization and establishment of a new architecture and engineering center of expertise for PWGSC Western Region, where he leads his teams to generate responsive, innovative, and economically viable solutions for federal organizations. Sam joined the Royal Architecture Institute of Canada in 2001 as an international associate based in Southern Africa. In 2003, he emigrated from Botswana to Canada and became actively involved with the RIAC. Um, in 2006, working with past president Vivian Manas and Lynn Rodriguez, excuse me, Rodriguez, Rodriguez, and uh, some have established Canada's first local um, RIC, RAIC chapter in Alberta, where he later served as its president in, from 2007 to 2008. During his tenure, he championed several initiatives that raise the awareness of the importance of architecture in Alberta, including an exhibition of Alberta architecture at the 2006 Smithsonian Folklife Festival in Washington, D.C., where he curated the exhibits in the Urban Alberta Pavilion. A strong adherent of integrating architecture, architectural practice with research and academia, and this is so vital to the collaboration that we are witnessing here today. Um, Sam believes that it's not just enough to have a private practice, but that as a practitioner, as a professional, there needs to be that continued conversation uh, with the universities, with the ivory tower, uh, as a way of enriching both the academic aspect of the practice and at the same time as the academic and benefiting from the field practice. I think that's a wonderful combination uh, that he pursues. Sam serves an adjunct lecturer at Durban University of Technology and the University of Victoria in Southern Africa. He has been a studio critic at the University of Calgary and Carleton University, and so in a sense, he's back home. Uh, welcome home, um, Sam. Um, a member of the American Institute of Architecture. He was a chartered architect with the Royal Institute of British Architects, 2000 to year 2000 to 2007, and um, is fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute. Uh, Sam has the distinction of being the first Canadian of African descent to hold the very prestigious uh, president of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. Uh, in so many respects, uh, Sam's role today and the talk that he is giving uh, seeks to bridge two countries and two continents, uh, North America and Africa, Nigeria and Canada. Uh, given the background of the momentous election that has taken place in the country. Uh, given his vast experience across the world and being a very erudite scholar and a very prolific architect, uh, we couldn't find any more qualified uh, professional to give a talk as this. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my singular honor to invite Sam Obo to give the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Prof. Tiano. Good evening, everyone. And um, I'm really very happy and excited to be here. And thank you, Vivian Manask, that you talked about. Vivian Manask, past president of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. She's been a pillar of support. And, uh, you know, I, 
I have a lot to say. She flew in from Edmonton, you know, to attend, you know, this. So that's that's really. And then also Maria Cook from the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. Thanks for the support. And uh, what um, uh, Unduka, you know, probably did not mention is the fact that this lecture was actually put together in a matter of weeks. And thanks to Bla uh, Professor Blair Rutherford, who was actually very instrumental in getting this, you know, happening within a matter of days. You know, and uh, and I think you know this speaks to a lot of things. So without uh, much further ado, I would really like to get into the topic to kind of understand that uh, this is more like a hybrid. The fact that we're here under the auspices of the um, uh, the Institute of African Studies and also the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism, uh, being represented here by Giancarlo. And, and the number of you know, people is the fact that we need to actually look at something that will benefit both you know, institutes. So I hope I'll be able to do justice to that. And as um, Unduka mentioned, uh, there has been some political shifts. Uh, uh, the original intent of this lecture was also to kind of commemorate the political shift that happened in Nigeria, right, with a new government taking over from uh, you know, a, a previous uh, government that has been in power for some time. And also, interestingly or coincidentally, just a few days ago, we experienced that monumental shift in Alberta, uh, you know, which is, you know, my uh, province of origin in Canada. Okay. And also, it was kind of very interesting that over the weekend, uh, there was the so-called fight of the century, you know, that may have occurred in Las Vegas, right, between uh, um, Floyd Mayweather and, uh, and Manny uh, Pacquiao. And uh, it's, I thought maybe that's a good place, you know, to start from, to remind people that once upon a time there was actually, you know, the fight of the century that did happen in Africa, right? You know, I don't know whether the one in Las Vegas was really the fight of the century. <laughs> so, uh, in 1971, I... Um, an undefeated, you know, Ali, um, you know, faced the heavyweight you know, uh, champion, Joe, Ruda, uh, Joe Fraser. And a lot of interesting, you know, things, you know, did happen, right, you know, in that fight. Uh, that Joe Fraser actually, um, at that fight was also called fight of the century, believe it or not. It seems as if that's something that is very common in the boxing world. And after a, a, a grueling 15 rounds, you know, the winner was declared, Joe Fraser did the impossible. You know, he defeated, you know, Ali. And then in 1973, um, Muhammad Ali, you know, faced uh, um, heavyweight champion Ken Norton. And just like Fraser did a couple of years before, uh, Norton defeated Ali, breaking Ali's jaw in a 12-round slugfest. So uh, from uh, Joe Fraser, Ken Norton, you know, beat the living daylight out of Muhammad Ali in, in a couple of years. And then entered the ring Judge Foreman, the menacing, dangerous, six foot, six, uh, sorry, six foot three, 220 pound uh, machine that struck terror in the hearts of men who fought for a living at that time. Uh, so uh, first, when Judge Foreman met with uh, uh, um, Joe, who uh, defeated Muhammad Ali, uh, John, John, uh, Judge Foreman actually knocked him down six times before the referee stopped, you know, the fight, and uh, that is, you know, in the second round. And um, then also, uh, Ken Norton also had the opportunity of facing Judge Foreman, and Judge Foreman actually, uh, you know, broke. So, Ken Norton was the guy that actually broke Ali's jaw, right? Faced George Foreman, and George Foreman actually taught him a lesson. So, when the rumble in the jungle was announced in 1974, it was to be an epic battle of the ages. George Foreman versus Muhammad Ali in, in Democratic Republic of uh, Congo in 1974. And when the night of the fight finally arrived, the boxing world was really on edge, and most felt that Ali was going to take a savage beating. 
even the atmosphere in Ali's you know, changing room was really very tense and it was so quiet as if it was a funeral um, uh, you know, service you know, in, in terms of that. And Ali even had to ask you know, what's the issue. Of course, you know, the reason was very clear. They all feared for Ali's life, you know, because he's about to face, you know, a machine that, you know, um, a machine that is, has been very, un, uh, is undefeatable. So, um, in the beginning of the first round, Ali traded punches, you know, with Foreman. Soon, however, you know, Ali, uh, you know, started uh, feeling, you know, the pounding of Foreman on his body. And with those huge arms, um, Ali ran, uh, you know, for cover to protect himself. And three minutes later, the bell rang, and that was the end. But one of the things that Ali did was, at the end of the first round, instead of sitting down, he stares across the ring, you know, looking at Foreman, and you know, with his, you know, with his mind or his heart racing. And uh, he has he has finally felt, you know, the punching power of Foreman. And the power that crushed Fraser and Norton, you know, Ali cannot definitely go toe to toe with George Foreman. So he lets uh, Foreman, you know, continue to pound his body with his right fist. And then suddenly Foreman changed or changes hands. <laughs> he begins punching Ali with his left hand. Eventually, after rounds of punching Ali, uh, Foreman got was exhausted. So in the eighth round of the fight, you know, Ali did the impossible. He knocks out, you know, the mighty Judge Foreman. And um, I guess the question is, but you know, how did Ali, you know, do that? Ali definitely did not knock down Judge Foreman, you know, based on his strength, but or with the power of his fist. But he he used the tactics which he later described as the rope a dope, you know, uh, strategy. And um, you know, people along the ringside will later recall throughout all the punches that Ali was whispering, right? Into you know, Ali was whispering into the ears of um, of Judge, you know, uh, Foreman, and uh, you know, he was definitely taunting, you know, Judge Foreman, uh, you know, ask, talk, telling him that he must not have much of the left, you know, hand, and that's, you know, that's particular uh, whispering, you know, may have been responsible for Ali, you know, winning the fight. So if you remember, just because Judge Foreman had a very powerful right hand, you know, hitting um, Ali, made Ali had to come up with a different strategy. So I guess I can imagine, you know, the $64 million question that is probably going on in everyone's mind, that what has this got to do with the topic, you know, at hand in terms of uh, you know, stewardship and uh, good governance, you know, in, in, in Nigeria, or what does this have to do with architecture, right? Uh, that story that I just, you know, told, uh, Terry Riley, uh, the famous Canadian uh, advertising guru, uh, now famous for his uh, CBC radio program, Under the Influence, used this story to introduce, uh, to introduce one of his episodes, the subtle art of nudging, where he explained how schools, marketers, and even governments are now using small nudges to gently steer people towards making more positive decisions in their lives. With those whispers in Foreman's ears, Ali nudged Foreman to make a small change, and that small change earned Ali the heavyweight you know, uh, title. So uh, before proceeding any further, I would like to uh, lay out, you know, some vital disclaimers and upfront, you know, disclosures, you know, for, for this talk. So uh, first and foremost, um, I know that architects are masters of many things, and they do know a lot about excellence uh, in design. But it may come as a surprise, you know, to everyone here, especially my wife, actually, that we are no authorities, you know, in certain areas, including, you know, the subject of good governance. So stewardship, you know, behavioral sciences and all that, you know, I do not claim to be an expert in that area, neither do architects claim to be experts in that area, but definitely we know a lot about excellence and we are willing to share that knowledge with people. Um, that said, uh, as perceptive good stewards of the built environment and resources, 
you know, that our clients usually entrust you know, to our care, uh, we do have a lot of experience you know, to share. Uh, if in doubt, you know, just uh, take a look at you know, a, a number of, um, a number of uh, you know, buildings and experiential uh, things that you know, architects have been able to, to do. Um, secondly, the views and analysis and opinions that are provided in this talk are not necessarily a representation of any organization or any government department or agency. <laughs> they are solely in my mind, right? So, um, and considering the fact that this presentation is taking place under the auspices of the Institute of African Studies and the Architecture uh, School, the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism, I will I hope that uh, it is harmless to make two basic assumptions here. First, that the audience that we have here are experts and enthusiasts knowledgeable about African matters, mm -hmm. and as such, know Nigeria and its vibrant, creative, and resilient people, as well as the antecedent of its past uh, you know, government. And then uh, secondly, too, um, that we all have encountered and experienced you know, architecture here in Canada and hopefully on a profound and, and intimate you know, level. And, and by intimate and personal architecture, I only refer to the experiential awe and inspiration one derives from the visceral level from the edifices you know, that, that we create to edify. So, and when I use the word personal and intimate, I'm not really, I'm just saying, you know, um, go easy on the uh, Marilyn, you know, Monroe uh, thoughts, you know, and um, let's actually, uh, Marilyn Monroe Tower in Mississauga does exist, but that's not necessarily what I mean by intimate you know, experience with, with architecture, but it's more about the kind of awe and inspiration that we all get. So, um, the idea of voicing the term good governance, stewardship, excellence, you know, and Nigeria together in the same breath may sound, you know, uh, preposterous to many. But with the uh, knowledge at our disposal, I would like to make, you know, an alternative case. I submit that, you know, for a people persistently subjected to failures, and as you know, failures associated with a sovereign state that looks like a geographical uh, arrangement created for the administrative convenience of the colonialists, as some have described Nigeria to be, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of good governance, stewardship, and Nigeria should not be seen as a mutually exclusive, uh, you know, concept. So uh, stewardship. Excellence, like someone rightly noted, you know, hopefully where there's stewardship and excellence, uh, there is that uh, that can equal to something very good. So, with a new government, you know, at the end of our first in Nigeria, uh, with the May 29 groundbreaking election uh, that brought about uh, Mohamed Buhari, you know, as the new president uh, from May 29, um, there is this hope and anticipation and yearning for quality of life that is expressed you know, by every segment of the population. And the new government's promise of no business as usual, making a good uh, governance a priority, is driving a renewed sense of optimism, hope, and expectation for change. And these, uh, you know, and this can be translated into the impossible and the unable uh, you know, to change, which used to characterize Nigeria, is now being turned into Yes, a lot of things are possible, and a lot of things are going. Uh, you know, they are able to do a lot of things. And the questions in the mind, you know, of many in Nigeria right now is a lot of these promises can they be achieved? And the answer might just be from the lessons from the Ali and Foreman fight, and where like Ali did in 1974. I, you know, using the power of its own whispers, I think that there is a lot for uh, the country to actually learn from this, to be able to steer the country in the right direction. Um, so, yeah, 
I do know that you know the whole concept of nudging. I'll talk about it you know later, but just to provide you know, a little bit of background, you know, on that nudging is actually extensively used in the marketing uh, world, you know, right now. Just in case you don't know that nudging is happening, yes, it's definitely you know happening. Uh, there, uh, like Terry Riley tells stories of you know supermarkets in Virginia, for instance, you know where each shopping cart you know, had, you know, um, a line of, you know, yellow tape dividing the carts, you know, into two. And uh, one of the signs, you know, talks about fresh fruit in certain, you know, in a portion of the cart and uh, the other was just, you know, left that way. When shoppers saw how um, few fruits and vegetables were in front compared to the less healthy items in the back, they were influenced to change, you know, the way they shopped, you know, and they went in and get more vegetables, you know, and all that. And the vegetable products actually shot up by almost about 102 percent in that particular, you know, shop. So the visual of divide, uh, the, the, the visual of the dividing line in the shopping cart is a nudge, right? And also, uh, there is also the story of, um, you know, the airport in Amsterdam where they actually had the issue in the male washroom of overspraying. And uh, one of the interesting way that they actually addressed, you know, the problem of overspraying. Of course, you know that men really love to spray, you know, and um, uh, in the urinals and the drain, what they did is they etched a house fly in the urinals, and because men love to aim, <laughs> right, you know, so they were able to solve that problem. That etched house fly is actually the nudge that changed, you know, the behavior and stopped that overspraying. Um, uh, you know, uh, issue, and that's because men just love to aim at things, right? You know, so, uh, so that said, you know, the art of nudging and making, you know, good decision, and um, you know, remarkable. Um, they, they're remarkable, but they are subtle, right? That's what nudging is about, and. Governments are using it, you know, the government of uh, British government, the Prime Minister of Britain, Cameron, uh, which incidentally is going through an interesting election, you know, May 7. Uh, they have the BIT, which is the, um, the Behavioral Insight Team, where they've been able to do quite a number of, you know, experiments with nudging, where, you know, sending, you know, handwritten, you know, notes to get people to pay their tax. Just that handwritten note made people actually pay their fines quicker and faster. You know, there's still a lot that's going on on that. So, obviously, nudging is not a new concept in Nigeria. Um, every day, for those that are familiar with Nigeria, uh, from the treacherous, you know, Molue, which is the local, you know, bus, you know, driver, and the conductors, um, the conductors are usually people that you know steer people to come and take you know the bus. Uh, there's just a lot that you know happens. It's not a strange you know a foreign culture to nudge people, and um, most times you know what they are saying or how they are nudging people with their incomprehensive you know hand sign, uh, it's kind of remarkable. Or when you go to the different communities, whether it's the traders that try to nudge people to. Um, you know, to get things done. The Nigerian government actually in the 80s had set up, you know, an organization called MAMSA, which is the Mass Mobilization for Self-Reliance and Social Justice, where they used all sorts of theatrical, um, uh, theatrical, uh, you know, nudges, you know, to get people to change their behavior. So it's not anything new. However, you know, because of critics, you know, nudging has its own critics. You know, people like... Uh, uh, Dr. Magda Osman from Queen Mary University in London is actually one of the main critics of uh, using, you know, nudges by governments, you know, to make uh, uh, changes. So the critics have actually uh, noted that nudge does not necessarily make any change uh, you know, or lead to significant behavioral change in people. And I would like to do a detour from this behavioral science, you know, to, uh, to architecture. Uh, just to um, to put a light or highlight some of the things that have been done successfully, uh, you know, in our own little way. The stories that you know Nigerians you know tell one another about the state of affairs, you know, of the country. Many of them, which are subject of future talks, not necessarily going to go through that. Depends on who is telling the story. Interestingly, many of them. 
have, um, you know, many of them are fascinatingly inspiring. And with others, you know, that are, you know, demoralizing and outright frustrating because they are often about the shock of the unexpected and contradictions. The stories often depict, you know, the resilience and the gustiness of, the, sorry, the gutsiness and fortitude of the people to actually bear the ills of forced depravity and untold hardship in the midst of plenty. So, um, just like, you know, the tales of success in Nigeria a lot, there's also a lot of, you know, contradictions and unexpected shock. So what you see there, you know, on the screen is actually a typical uh, gas station in Nigeria where it is actually inconceivable that for a country that is the largest producer of crude oil or Africa's largest oil producing country, this is the kind of scene that, you know, it's very, uh, very common. So it's actually not logical, right? And then uh, also when you look at the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics 2010 poverty profile, uh, some of the contradictions in the country includes the fact that 60.9% of the population of Africa's biggest oil producer, they are actually living in absolute poverty, about you know 60.9%. This is from the Nigerian government statistics, and I could never understand why uh, a country you know like Nigeria, that is Africa's largest you know economy according to the International Monetary Fund and also the CIA World Book, you know, facts, a country that actually boasts of, you know, some of the most highly skilled, most talented, you know, resources that you can ever think of, you know, inequality, electricity shortages, uh, you know, and a host of other failures are really very persistent. So, um, why do we fail when we talk about all these failures, right, you know, within, you know, the system? The, um, the, the, the quality of life of all Nigerians in all social strata, right, as far as the system is concern, concerned, is such that um, <coughs> there is a lot of depravity and also, um, you know, there is a lot of failures, you know, at all levels, depending on how, you know, we're judging, you know, some of those items. But there's really no good reason that is good enough to explain these failures. And I thought, you know, it would be nice to revert to some of the people that know a lot about failures. While this presentation is not, you know, about, you know, failures, I do believe that understanding why we fail uh, can steer us to the right solution. So on this, I kind of drew on the work of uh, the philosopher Samuel Gorovitz and Alasdair McIntyre, which... Um, Atul Gewande uh, actually did, um, did refer to in one of his books, The Checklist Manifesto, which is actually a very interesting book you know, to, to go through. It's a book about the medical world, but uh, it's really very interesting how they looked at it. So uh, essentially, when we look at um, you know, why we failed, it boils down to two things. In um, ignorance and ineptitude. Those are the two reasons, you know, why we fail. And our pro there, are pro there, are, there are a lot of, you know, experiments and uh, studies that have gone, you know, on this item to look at, you know, this whole issue of, you know, failures and ineptitude and ignorance. Um, right now, I think we are in the 21st century where ignorance is not necessarily, you know, most of the things, you know, that uh, that that is an issue, but ineptitude as a result of how we manage information, how we get you know, things done. So it is based on this that I would really like to you know, steer our attention to some of the case study you know, that was done with Public Works Canada, for instance, uh, you know, in nudging stewardship and uh, a good protocol. As you can see, I had you know, some, some books you know, there that actually showed you know, what those are. One of the uh, small but extremely significant subset of um, you know, uh, public, uh, of what architecture is, is public buildings. You know, very many of us are very, this is actually something that is very symbolic, you know, to everyone can relate to the Peace Tower. And public buildings, by that I'm referring to any building that has been, um, any building that, actu that has actually been, um, uh, any building that has actually been funded by true public uh, resources. The, so, whether it's the uh, government buildings or the fire halls or the 
or the civic, uh, you know, building. A number of things are very clear. You know, these buildings are a reflection of who we are as a community. They are also, um, you know, places where uh, we learn to sharpen our mind and we do, you know, a lot of things. They are expressed, you know, in a language that is mostly discernible in our subliminal consciousness. And these public buildings, you know, uh, what you see there, for instance, is the uh, uh, Museum of Human Rights in Winnipeg, right? It's a reflection, you know, the physical, you know, expression of the architecture of the nation is also, um, you know, where we, uh, where public policies are debated, where important, you know, aspects of our democracies, you know, are, are extended. So the point here is that these buildings are actually of immense value to the society, but if designed poorly, if they are designed poorly, they have potential to both diminish quality of life and the importance of architecture as well as create ongoing financial burden to taxpayers. So through several research studies on how buildings perform over time, um, conducted by different organizations around the world, whether it's the, uh, um, you know, the Commission for Architecture and Built Environment or the GSA, you know, the US government, we realize that you know, good design remains the most reliable prerequisite for achieving responsible architecture. And the best value in, in public buildings can only be achieved through good design. And so, of course, as one can imagine, defining that you know, term good design is always a very difficult task to do. Very subjective is an indeterminate concept you know, with all sorts of subjective overtones. But that's definitely the backbone of responsible architecture. And having said this, of course, uh, you know, being an architect, not wanting to shy away from you know uphill task, I thought you know coming up with a definition, right, will really be very helpful. That good design is the balanced combination of efficiency, effectiveness, and economy of means, which is really very important. Economy of means to meet an intended purpose, and. Um, we know from several studies that good design or lack of it causes happiness or misery. People have a lot of experiences, even personal experiences, that when things are not designed properly, for instance, you can relate to it. Even though good design is a key predicator of happiness and essentially for achieving an efficient and effective economically viable building, accomplishing you know, good design is not a given. You know, it doesn't matter how much we think we know about it, it's not a given. And the question is, why is that the case? Of course, you know, um, it's interesting, you know, some of the questions at the mind of many, how is it that despite the mounting evidence supporting the fact that good design creates numerous benefits within the society, uh, it, it continues to elude a lot of public buildings. To answer this, a glimpse into the world of behavioral sciences can actually, you know, answer that. And it's based on the fact that, you know, consumers are not always rational in their decisions, right? When giving, you know, the choice. So many times, you know, we'll always make short-sighted decisions when provided with good options. It's just inbuilt in our DNA, you know, most times, you know, you know, that. So considering this irrational human tendencies, making poor decisions is not limited to individuals, but also a large organizations, you know, like uh, 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 PWGSC also is not immune from that. Corporate outfits, oil companies, they are also not immune from making poor decisions or nor they are aware of, you know, some of the um, uh, uh, irrational decisions that we make sometimes. So this is actually an important cue, you know, that you know we have learned and known, you know, for some time. So based on this knowledge, right, uh, just a background: an organization like you know Public Works that manages the largest and most diverse portfolios of uh, real estate in Canada, with an annual operating budget of over 4.5 billion, uh, building programs and services. It's kind of you know interesting that uh, through the um, whole of life, you know, costs. Uh, analysis of its building, right? Uh, architects and engineers and contractors are usually involved in this portion of, you know, less than 0.5%, but most of the cost of the buildings 
you know, actually happen after the buildings have been built. However, what you do or don't do at this stage determines, you know, a lot of things that happen, right, in, in the other phases, you know, of life. So it's, uh, it's a matter of recognition of this, you know, fact that we thought, uh, what can we do? So uh, in spite of the benefit associated with good design, uh, for instance, uh, we still have you know, a lot of uh, challenges, you know, to deal with. So we've learned that, you know, good design has to be deliberately championed, it has to be valued, it has to be, you know, it has to be pursued. So, um, but within public works, I'm using that as a case study here because they actually do have a definition for stewardship. And for them, you know, stewardship, you know, affirms um, you know, uh, you know, they affirm stewardship through good design, and it's it is defined as the responsible, sustainable, and effective management of assets, and that really resonates, you know, a lot, uh, it, you know, in terms of the definition of stewardship. But in spite of that, right, one of the lessons we've learned is in order to allow good design to reign, it must be valued. It must be championed and it must be pursued. <coughs> good design does not just happen, and you know the architects, you know, amidst us, we actually know that that's that's a conscious decision. It's easy to assume that you know that that will happen. So, large organizations like public works that have all sorts of processes, you will kind of assume that with all these processes, it should lead to good design. But most times, you find out that these processes are mainly very quantitative, and you know they are very onerous and and, and the, the, the KPI is the key performance indicators that we use in judging all these um, uh, processes are actually three things, scope, cost, and time. <coughs> and from experience, this will hardly lead to good design. Yes, they are good quantitative measures, but they're not really qualitative measures that can be used to lead you know, to that, uh, to that uh, good design. So it is against this backdrop that, you know, um, we, uh, an innovative quality management tool known as the Stewardship Excellence Protocol was purposefully developed to steer public works, right, you know, uh, Canada built asset to positive outcomes through good design. Now, what is this uh, Stewardship you know, Excellence Protocol, you know, about? It actually encapsulates, you know, the whole concept of nudging and choice architecture. So uh, for this, the, the, whole, the concept of nudging and choice architecture was actually made popular by uh, behavioral science and economics professor Richard Thaler and Cass Sustins in their 2008 book uh, titled Nudge. And uh, for those that know people like Cass Sustins and Richard Thaler, even the Obama administration actually hired them to start up the Nudge team in the White House, you know, to do things, you know, in there. So. Um, you know, this is actually a deliberate, you know, design of choices used to steer someone to positive outcome. So the Stewardship Excellence Protocol uh, acknowledges that in many instances, the way an option is framed, the way we present an option, right, um, can influence the decisions, you know, that, uh, that happens, you know, for the better. So. Within this stewardship excellence protocol, there are actually seven key principles that nudges public works to promote, you know, productive, accessible, and viable real property solutions for Canada. And as the saying goes, uh, if you always do what you've always done, you will always get what you've always gotten. I mean, that's a no-brainer. Even though it's attributed to Henry Ford, there are a lot of people that I have actually, you know, said that. So based on that. We decided to use, you, you know, use the apple metaphor. I'm not going to go into the details of, you know, the principles of the stewardship excellence protocol, but I'm just trying to outline, you know, some of the things that we're used to nudge, you know, uh, good behaviors or good design within the organizations. So it's not unusual in a place like public works and government services to use metaphors like brick and mortar, the pillars of, uh, you know, good design and all that. And we thought, okay, let's shift away from it. And we use the Apple metaphor to, you know, present the protocol as opposed to using all those rigid sounding analogies of pillars, building blocks, you know, and all that. And understanding that metaphors allow us to understand or experience one thing in terms of another, 
we thought that would be a very good uh, way of, 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 of putting it. So putting it, putting it in another word, we are just trying to express the unfamiliar with the familiar. So through Apple themed you know, iconography and graphics, we were able to express the freshness and vitality of the protocol. And the Apple allowed us to use various anecdotes to animate the old saying that an Apple a day keeps the doctor, the doctor away. As a result, um, you know, people have been able to relate better to why good design needs to be a synchronous or an absolute necessity in our public buildings. So the stewardship excellence protocol actually delineates good design with a specific set of um, you know, principles uh, or what I call principle-based characteristics, so as to assure excellence, and uh, you know, and also consistency within public works. And these are, uh, you know, creativity and technical competence, uh, functional suitability, whole of life, you know, financial performance, uh, health, safety, and security, inspiring and attractive, appropriate innovation, and sustainable and enduring. I'm not going to really dwell into the details of this, you know, because these are subjects of uh, uh, future talks because there's a lot, you know, in there. But the protocol, you know, was summarized, you know, in the matrix, right? And the whole idea is that the matrix of the protocol, uh, which um, I think it's very important to actually show that I don't have that in the slide, but. I think it's really very important, just one item. Everything was actually summarized into, you know, the matrix, you know, that way. And that's what, that is actually the nudge, you know, most times. Just the presence of this little matrix, you know, created, you know, a lot of things. So, um, our experience is that, you know, so, we're able to nudge, you know, good design, just getting, you know, people to follow the and I'll just explain briefly, you know, how that happened. Our experience on, you know, certain projects, oh, okay, is that um, when design managers in our organizations are provided with this uh, uh, metrics, um, during preliminary design phase, because in the architecture world we have different phases, you know, they've been able to demonstrate that, you know, the submittals that we get from consultants address key principles of the protocols. And we found out that their solutions were far more comprehensive and better than, you know, project solutions submitted where this matrix was not provided. It's kind of interesting. So on projects that we provide this matrix, right, the outcome is different. Projects that we We've not provided these metrics where they have to, you know, make sure that they satisfy all those requirements. It was, it was interesting. So, for example, you know, after receiving, you know, uh, several uninspiring schematic design submission on a high-profile research lab project, which is uh, is high-profile because it's really very important to the Prime Minister's uh, Northern Strategy in Canada, uh, we tried this nudge experiment, you know, on it, and. You know, to steer the design team to better design option, and in spite of the fact that their contract actually ex require that, you know, design excellence you know need to be done, we found dramatic improvements, you know, in their submissions, you know, just because the protocol metrics, you know, were provided in order for them to, you know, address things. And I guess the question is, did the metrics of the stewardship excellence protocol spur them, you know, to think of uh, the design in comprehensive manner, or you know, or where the uh, courtesy of just the metrics provided served as a reminder of good design. Uh, we it's hard to say, right, on this project. But you know, the key thing there is that uh, you know that matrix was more like a small note that kind of led to you know better you know things. So the question is, how does this translate you know you know to the Nigerian context? Um, Nigeria, like I said, is an interesting country with a lot of contradictions and you know a lot of uh, paradox. That's a country with abundance, you know, natural and human resources, and that's also a country that uh, is, you know, with this abundance resources, there's also the you know corruption, insecurity, deteriorating educational um, 
uh, challenges, the crumbling infrastructure, and all sorts of things. And um, these are failures that need to be fixed, right? And many of them are actually avoidable failures. And so drawing an inspiration from the uh, you know, stewardship you know, excellence uh, uh, protocol, which, uh, which I just you know, described, it is actually important to note that uh, just like you know, public works you know, use that initiative to start nudging you know, good design, it is important that we face the Nigerian situation from a, very, uh, from a problem centered approach rather than to a theory centered approach. That was the approach that we took in establishing you know, the stewardship excellence protocol, which was a problem centered approach that certain attentions were not being paid to certain things and we had to make sure that uh, you know, just presenting it or framing you know, the options in a particular way allowed you know, people to take on that. So uh, the, 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 the idea of that is um, as one of the authors of uh, the Nudge uh, book, right, Carl Sosten noted, it is morally better for the state to try to shape positively how we take decisions rather than leave it to chance. So similarly in Nigeria, I think that the failures you know, can be addressed from a problem-centered approach. And in tackling these failures, of course, mistakes will be made. And um, uh, we're hoping that the new government uh, will actually see you know, some of those uh, you know, mistakes as a good place to, uh, to start. And also to have zero tolerance for ineptitude and not, you know, um, rely on ignorance as the basis you know, of information. So understanding that no one builds a house you know, to suffocate people or build the facilities to suffocate people intentionally. Sometimes, you know, understanding that people will erect you know, bad buildings right, or erect them wrongly, uh, it's always good to see what you can do. So if you have to nudge good you know, behaviors, good design, that's you know one thing that you know uh, can really be very helpful. So uh, what I've just explained is actually what good steward, uh, good design, you know, is all about, and how you know the knowledge is. But how does this relate to you know good governance and good design? And so considering that you know I'm not an expert in this field, like I did mention earlier on, um, you know we needed to look at you know the definition of good design as defined by the United Nations and some of the international agencies. Uh, that good design most times is always about you know the process of you know making decisions, and it's not necessarily about whether it's good or you know bad decision. But if you have a good process of making decisions, uh, most times uh, it is um, it is very likely that you know you'll be able to come up with uh, uh, you know outcomes that will serve the world better. And this is one of the characteristics or one of the things lessons that you know uh, you can take from the architectural world. So, for instance, the seven major um, you know, characteristics of good governance as, as outlined by uh, the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific uh, echoes the seven principles that were contained in the stewardship you know, excellence uh, you know, protocol. So I'll just kind of go high level into you know, each of the uh, principles. I, for those that are interested, I actually do have more in it that goes in depth in it, but I'll just you know look at it from a very you know high level you know point of view. So one of the first principles from the stewardship excellence protocol or from the uh, principles of good design is creativity and technical competence. Of course, you know in, from the good governance world, you know it tells you that you know good governance is effective, you know and and and, and efficient. So. Just like you know, creativity and technical competence is essential in coming up with the best architectural solutions. Um, you know that you know influences people. Uh, you know the quality of life in our society. Um, it is very important. You know to see that this is also the foundation of having you know good you know governance. So like Archimedes, you know, will always say, "Give me a place to stand." With a lever, and I will move the world. It is paramount for the Buhari, you know, uh, administration in Nigeria, uh, you know, to surround itself with creative and technically competent, you know, people. 
you know, competent team that will actually help look at, you know, all areas or all levels of leadership, you know, within the country because these particular principles, you know, uh, principle, you know, does a lot of magic in the architectural world. Having a very creative and technically competent team, the outcome is usually, you know, mind blowing. So where there is lack of technical uh, creativity and technical competence, of course, mediocrity, you know, is the order of the day, and productivity suffers. So uh, I always say to people, Nigeria is not a resource-challenged country, right? And like people like uh, Tony, um, you know, Tony Robbins will always say, right? It is never about resources. You know, most times we complain, oh, we don't have time, we don't have the resources, we don't have the money. No, it's always about resourcefulness. So this is really very instrumental, uh, you know, for the new government, Buhari administration, that resourcefulness is one of the keys and is a foundation of, of, of good governance to make sure that it's efficient, effective, and all that. And to kind of put this, I, I mean, put, putting this in a different light, why do you have to hire, you know, a plumber, for instance, you know, who has no experience in electrical fitting, you know, hire a plumber to actually, you know, uh, you know, create a rural electrification, you know, project or an electrical project. Of course, you know, the the outcome is going to be disastrous, and I don't think anyone will want to be there when you are flipping the switch, you know, on in that kind of, you know, facility. So. Creativity and technical competence very important. The second principle is functional suitability, and that's really very important to us, you know, in the architecture in the architectural world. Because in order for it to ensure good design, functional suitability it has to be appropriate for its place and its use. Very important, or else you know you're going to be designing things that are inappropriate. You're going to be having you know a lot of issues, and this is. Uh, you know, also echoing the fact that in terms of good governance, good governance is very responsive. The um, uh, the Buhari, which we normally we normally abbreviate his name to GMB, General Mohammed Buhari. You know, the GMB led administration really look, have to look at you know the prerequisites. You know, that is that all forms, all level of governments actually require to make sure that. You know, there's that responsiveness, and in order for you to, you know, come up with that responsiveness, functional suitability is really very, 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 very important. That you have to design things that are appropriate for its place and its use. You have to come up with policies that are appropriate. That also takes into account, you know, the whole Nigerian, uh, you know, uh, factor and Nigerian uh, community. So, uh, you know, to put this in another context, I always remember the late Miles Monroe, who, um, who is always saying things about purpose, right? That uh, when the purpose of something is not known, abuse is inevitable. Obviously, uh, if you have a tool like, in, if you have a knife and you use it as a hammer, you know, with time, it, you know, you have to replace that knife. And what that is, is that, um, you know, you're wasting resources that would have been used, you know, for other areas of needs. So, um, I think things need to be channeled in the right direction to serve the needs of the entire country and ensure fit for purpose. Uh, the third, you know, principle which, you know, is instrumental is the whole of life financial performance. And this, you know, in terms of good governance world, I think it's about being accountable, accountability. And this is about you know the operations of of the country to make sure that you know you achieve best value. It means that um, you know uh, citizens you know need need to have you know better quality of life, and we need to stop you know the leakages right in the country. And by that you know we're talking about you know corruption, and you know some of the ills you know within the society. So. Uh, whole of life performance is fundamental requirement of you know governor. It speaks to you know investing you know early upfront, right? Where you you know invest you know upfront to make sure that things you know happen you know in a better way. And when you talk about you know the quality of life, when you stop you know the leak that you know it's happening within the system, and you have a better quality of life, what it does is that. Um, you know, the people are happy, the quality of life is better, and what comes to mind is the whole concept of gross national happiness, which uh, a lot of us are familiar with, with the Bhutan that was uh, made popular by the former king of Bhutan, uh, King uh, Jin Wachok, which hinges on, you know, uh, four pillars, sustainable development, preservation of 
and promotion of cultural values, establishment of good governance. You know, so that's really, really very, very important. So investing upfront in governance assures that corruption will be minimized while citizens and residents are empowered you know, to become productive, generate enough savings in the long term to uh, address some of the you know, economic you know, uh, problems you know, in the country. So why should we care about stopping the leak? Uh, or why should we care about whole of life you know, financial performance? Is that you know, uh, we should remember that a hungry, uneducated, sick, citizen, uh, sick um, uh, citizens in a country uh, without any formidable safety net, right, is just a time bomb waiting to explode. And that's really very, very important. So, and there's no shortage of that. The other aspect of good design, which, you know, is synonymous to some of the principles of uh, good governance, is health, safety, and security. And this one here, this is where accessibility and some of those responsive, uh, responsible aspects of architecture comes, you know, into place. You know, having a healthy, you know, uh, safe, you know, and security smart environment is really very, very instrumental. Uh, this also means, you know, equal rights, you know, for everyone in the country, particularly the most vulnerable, uh, to be protected and for opportunities to be guaranteed, opp opportunities to actually participate. And, you know, it also means that zero tolerance for criminal acts such as kidnapping and terror and you know, all the challenges in the country. So, um, inspiring and attractive. This is really something that people associate with architecture a lot, that, you know, we build, you know, buildings that are really very inspiring, very attractive, but it doesn't just come that way, right? You know, for you to have things that, are in, uh, you know, um, uh, that, uh, that inspire and attract. You know, in the same light, I think it's really uh, very important that uh, in order for us to you know, ensure that the quality of life uh, that you know, citizens you know, require, it needs to you know, inspire good participation. And not just inspire good you know, participation, you look at you know, the whole aspect of uh, wellness and healthy living you know, and all that. So through their distinctive character, the conduct of the Nigerian government has to convey a positive impression of the country by enhancing their immediate environment and contributing to the local sense of place, and also ensuring that there is a clear vision supporting the values you know, of the countries to attract, you know, the visitors to attract. You know. So uh, there's a lot to be said about you know, this principle, but if done re well, if done correctly, uh, it's enough to actually nudge a lot of things. Uh, appropriate innovation. Obviously, innovation is something that is very, um, important to us in the world of architecture and in the same vein uh, we expect the new government to be able to do more with less and that requires innovation that requires you know good resources and all that and so within the nigerian context i would think that a touch of transparency by the gmb led administration is in itself you know going to be quite innovative you know if you're able to create you know something that you know make sure that uh, there is access to information, privacy legislation, and all that you know that is related to good governance. Uh, sustainable and enduring, which is the seventh one. Um, good governance definitely is about you know the rule of law. It's also about you know uh, better decision making, but that's uh, that's how you ensure sustainability. So in our world, when we talk about sustainability, we are actually looking at. Um, you know, uh, you know, something that promotes, you know, resilient and enduring culture. So I think the best decision that the GMB-led government can make are those that assures the sustainable um, and enduring future of Nigeria. So in terms of, you know, decision making and, you know, involvement and, and, and honest deliberations. So, we're hoping that you know they're able to address social and environmental problems across the country, especially you know in the Niger Delta, uh, where uh, the oil the oil producing area, or whether it's in the northeastern part of the country where you have all these challenges, to be able to implement laws that effectively tackle the scourge of climate change and oil pollutions, 
you know, in the you know, in the country's fragile, you know, ecosystem. Also, it's really very important to win the country out of oil and waste and enable the rule of law and build institutions that strengthens, you know, the country's fledging democracy with citizens, uh, you know, where citizens will actually be less tempted to, um, to uh, less tempted to fight or attempt to overturn decisions, not even the most difficult and controversial one. So, that's more like you know looking at some of those principles. So I guess the question is, what next, right? Um, I always refer to the famous group of seven, you know, uh, Canadian painter um, Lawrence Harris, who once said, you know, the thoughts you know of yesterday cannot be expressed in the sorry, the thought of today cannot be expressed in the language of yesterday. Uh, there is a lot that is expected from the new administration, you know, in Nigeria. And we're hoping that taking cue from the Canadian architectural case studies, you know, presented that you know the uh, Buhari-led administration uh, will be able to explore and create series of you know um, uh, simple nudges grounded in the principles of good design and good governance to steer Nigeria to a positive outcome that will def uh, that will usher in improved quality of life, you know, for Nigerians. Um, as such, you know, such a new administration must make concerted efforts, you know, to find the failures in the system, and this is different from, you know, witch hunting. Uh, they have to find the failures, you know, in the system. They also have to look at ways of designing simple but effective solutions that assures a path to minimizing ineptitude, and in so doing, corruption is minimized to the barest minimum. Um, a nudge that is responsive to the present future need of society and where you know technologies can be leveraged you know to ensure that uh, you know public funds you know are secured and um, you know, and making things you know financial transactions that make it easy for you to have a lot of leak uh, it's made you know difficult so putting it in other way uh, the, 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 when you leverage technology and you're able to put you know, the right systems you know, in place, you can achieve an outcome that can save you know, uh, the public you know, within, uh, that can save uh, you know, uh, the public. So it's about you know, public goods, it's about saving money in the process. So understanding that it's harder for you to, uh, is harder, sorry, understanding that the harder you make things, right, you know, for people, the more, diff the more, uh, you know, or the less likely it is that they will do it. I think it's imperative, you know, to make sure that, you know, there are nudges, you know, that suit the Nigerian system that can be put in place and to make it difficult for corruption to thrive and easy for people to shun corruption. And I think that's really very, very important. So, are there concerns with this approach? You know, absolutely. Um, there are ethical and potential ethical uh, concerns. Uh, when government mix architectural processes, you know, economics and psychology, you know, to nudge citizens into making specific choice. But those concerns can be addressed uh, with transparent policies and leadership examples grounded in humility, you know, um, patriotic commitment and, uh, you know, discipline and teamwork. So I guess, you know, transparent communication is key to this. So. You know, talking about you know uh, you know uh, communication, one of the cues that we learned from the stewardship excellence protocol was how we were able to use anecdotes in communicating uh, some of those things. And when I talk about communication, I always remember a kind of nudge that my daughter, you know, sometimes you know normally you know use when she was um, when she was uh, five, uh, you know, when we were in Botswana. And most times she gets back from home. Uh, sorry, from school, and she or she's always addressing. She comes back home and start reciting what she was taught in school, you know, every day, and she does it in a very loud way. And for me, that's a nudge, you know, to nudge the parents to kind of listen to her. So on this uh, particular day, I I still remember vividly when she came in and she started reciting her arithmetic. Uh, one plus one, the son of the bitch is two. Um, you know, two plus two, the son of the bitch is four. And she was saying it so loud, you know, confidently. And we thought, I think, you know, we challenged her. And at that age, you have to remember that 
Um, the teacher is always correct. Parents know nothing, right? You know, so she insisted that that was what she was taught by her teacher. And to put it in context, that was around the time that she was exposed to characters like Eddie Murphy and the rest, right? So, uh, so, but we didn't take that lightly. We went to the school and asked, you know, the teacher. The teacher, by the way, is from Mauritius, you know. So, uh, you know, she's from Mauritius, teacher Rita. And we went to the school and asked her. Uh, is this the kind of communication or what we need to, you know, to do, uh, we need to be worried about? And we asked our daughter to recite it and she started again, one plus one, the son of a bitch, you know, it's two, two plus two. <laughs> so uh, at the end of the day, the teacher, you know, started laughing and said, well, usually when I teach them in class, you know, I always, you know, teach them to say things in full and I always say, one plus one, the sum of which is two. <laughs> two plus two, the sum of which is four. That became the son of the day. You know, so, uh, you know, the, the relevance there is, you know, for me, similar to good design. If good design, like I said, or good governance is not valued, or if it's not pursued, and if it's not communicated with clarity, right, we open ourselves to having one son of a bitch, impoverished, <laughs> depraved, you know, society. Uh, and, uh, you know, a society that is not, you know, inspired you know, in a lot of ways. So, so whether it's the story of, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali um, whispering his way to victory, or, uh, or whether it's, you know, the story about, you know, nudging or using good design principles to ensure that uh, no son of a bitch, you know, bad design live to see the, uh, the light of another day. Using metaphor of good design to uh, invoke excellence in good design, one thing is very clear. The world craves you know, for Nigeria to benefit from the dividends of our own good governance. And these cues from architecture and maybe um, you know, some of the few things that we've talked about may be small, right, within the scheme of things. They may be small, they may be almost invisible, but and they may be controversial, you know, there's a lot of things to be said, how effective, you know, they may be. Um, but it is for the benefit, you know, of the public. And we highly recommend, and I will highly recommend that the Buhari-led administration to emulate the world of architecture, look at all these principles that will nudge, uh, you know, good governance, so that we can nudge for good, create solutions that will enhance the quality of life, and assume, and sorry, for us not to assume that Nigerians don't care about you know good design and make stewardship and excellence you know as a hobby. And as Aristotle would always say, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act but a habit. So I'm hoping that at the end of the day, you know, with these little nudges, you know, we'll be able to steer Nigeria into the right direction. And these are some of the cues from architecture that I hope to present. Thank you for listening.